So if you have not been with us for the last several weeks now, this has been a tough, tough series that we have been uh, covering. Um, And the only reason why we've been talking about what are, you know, talking points in media these days of uh, the the LGBT uh, uh, agenda in the schools and and, uh, critical race theory and secular humanism and teen depression and suicide and today's topic of, uh, of socialism. Um, the only reason why I'm talking about these things, they're, they're political issues, and if you've been at Living Hope for a long time, you know that I generally don't speak on political issues. I'm just speaking to them because the reality is, is that these are subjects that our children are being exposed to, and as such, I think our kids need Christian talking points. They need truth around these subject matters, so that's why we've been uh, doing this. Again, if you're new to Living Hope, uh, wait till the next series. You'll see more of what we tend to do around here, and uh, for the rest of us. Uh, I, for one, am looking forward to moving on to another topic. However, I have to tell you right up front that uh, this is a big subject that honestly I tried and tried and tried to encapsulate it in one message and I failed. So this is part one of two-part message on this whole subject of socialism. Another uh, one of the topics that we brought up just about every week, how this is a subject that involves this subject of compassion, but as we've asked each week, does my view of compassion align with uh, God's view of compassion? And certainly the whole socialism uh, message is... uh, you know, trying to trying to do right by the people, if you will. So, as we get into this this morning, you know, just a few introductory thoughts that I want to share with you uh, as we jump in this morning. Number one, you should know this: that a perfect monetary system doesn't exist. Believe me, if it existed, nations would have adopted it. Everybody would be thriving. But the truth is, it doesn't exist. You know, in a fallen world, uh, um, we look for ways to try to be fair. Capitalism, socialism, uh, communism, fascism, any other type of ism. But the truth is, I don't think that there is an ism that guarantees fairness and equality for all. And the reason for that is sort of my second introductory thought is that uh, monetary systems are managed by less than perfect people because in the heart of men, there's greed. In the heart of men, there's power. In the heart of men, there's corruption. In a secular society, wherever people gather, and it could, these could be progressive people or conservative people. This could be left-leaning people or right-leaning people. These could be union labor types or corporate types. Listen, greed, power, and corruption are never far away. Can I get an amen? And of course, no leader is going to admit that. They all claim to be advocates for their constituents. They all claim to be uh, going about their business with an eye for fairness. But I tell you, in my observation, all have biases. All leaders have blind spots. Which brings me to enter point number three, which is that the Bible does not prescribe a specific monetary policy. But it is clear about these pillars of a stable economic system. As such, we support the systems and the leaders that most closely align with the biblical worldview of economics. And I'll go on record saying this morning without apology that of all the systems available right now, no question about it, capitalism aligns far closer uh, to these pillars than socialism does by a long shot. So let's talk about socialism, beginning with the question of what is it? (laughs) This is part of why we have to take two weeks to get into this, because it's a huge, huge subject. Socialists believe this, that the world's means of production, you think about socialism, it's primarily about the whole subject of labor and corporate leaders being right by the, the working guy versus the business owner, trying to create equality among working classes, understand all that. And so the means of production, and we talk about production, we're talking about things like infrastructure, farms, factories, energy, natural resources, medicine, education, and more. 
in the socialist mentality and by their philosophy, all of these things are to be controlled by what is called in their philosophy simply the people. In other words, society as a whole should own all the raw materials and the systems that produce wealth. All the people should own it, not just a select few. Now, in a free market system or a capitalistic system, these materials are controlled by either individuals or by companies. And both in socialist countries, uh, but in the socialist country, they're owned by the people. Now, of course, there's no way to make decisions based on such a loose concept of the people. And so under cap socialism, the government becomes the people. The government becomes the people who become the sole authority and controller over those natural resources. They become the means of production, the government does, ideally to ensure fairness and equality for all people. It's supposed to end the, the war between owners and laborers. Unfortunately, governments are controlled not by the people, but by specific people. And not the people at large. Those specific people happen to often be the kind of people who seek out power, who are entirely corruptible by greed and selfishness, lust, vindictiveness, and violence. Again, an overwhelming desire for power. And as more power flows to the government, the handful at the top, who are actually the decision makers, history has shown they tend to become dictatorial. And one of the most startling developments as I've been looking into this for the last month or two is that in these recent years, there's been a renewed enthusiasm for socialism, especially among millennials and Gen Z young people. Indeed, the polls show that American millennials and Generation Zers have a highly favorable attitude towards socialism. Polls indicate that upwards of 70% of the people in this age group favor socialism. They perceive socialism will provide more economic security, a greater sense of togetherness, more equality of wealth and income. Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez have championed the popularity of socialism in recent days, promising that under socialism, the things we want will be free. College education will be free. Health care will be free. Child care will be free. Housing will be free of charge. Is it any wonder that the generation will be like, yeah, let's go for that. And there's very little realization that these things require costly resources and must, at the end of the day, be paid for. <laughs> In other words, free means we ultimately have to give up other things. A lot of other things. And things that are absolutely priceless. That's what freedom means. Very seldom do you hear proponents of socialism addressing the other side of the coin, what the average person must give up to get those freebies, and how in the end it will be impossible to satisfy everybody's wants. Far fewer people's needs in the end have needs met than with capitalism or free market enterprise. Invariably, with socialism, there will be some kind of unpopular rationing procedure to determine who the lucky ones are to get the scarce items that are actually provided for free. Also, these rationing position, uh, procedures inevitably pose an irresistible temptation for corruption. Those deciding who actually get the scarce freebie item line their pockets with surreptitious payments from those most wanting it. And this happens all the time in socialistic communities. Overlooked as well is the tendency for such centrally econ economic systems 
to override personal freedom. When the government makes choices for us, we have ceded our right to make those choices ourselves. And the more choices that we've turned over to government, the more our personal freedom is curtailed. Yeah, the most recent example of this, first it was Greece, Venezuela. But in Venezuela, let's just take a look at what happened there. It's a recent example. Venezuela was once the wealthiest nation in South America. Their per capita income among their citizens was greater. Their income was greater than those of China and Japan. Their income was rivaling almost the income of U.S. citizens. They enjoyed religious liberty, political freedom, personal dignity, economic opportunity. And then in 1998, the Venezuela people elected Hugo Chavez as their president. And once in power, Chavez relentlessly implemented the socialist playbook that is formulated by the Soviet Union, by Cuba, by China, and many other nations. Chavez's first task was to rewrite the Venezuelan constitution, guaranteeing citizens the so-called free rights of government, guaranteeing citizens health care, free college education, and social justice. And when the Venezuelan Supreme Court ruled against Chavez on several important issues, He responded by stacking the court with 12 new justices, all of whom were loyal to him. Fully in control of the courts and the legislature, he he moved quickly to nationalize in Venezuela the media, removing every voice of dissent. Then he authorized government agencies to seize privately owned wealth and property from Venezuela citizens, all in the name of fairness and equality. Chavez took control of the nation's oil industry. He expelled all the foreign investors. He nationalized power companies, farms, mines, banks, grocery stores, And his final step was to eliminate term limits for elected officials, setting himself up to rule for the rest of his life in the style of Russian Stalin and Cuba's Castro. Does any of this sound a little familiar to y'all? And today, the currency of Venezuela, the bolivar, the equivalent of our dollar, which was once close, never quite as much, but it was actually quite close to the value of our dollar, has lost 99% of its value. Hyperinflation has spiraled out of control. And when I say hyperinflation, let me give you a few examples of what I mean. The Bolivar, this five-pound chicken now costs, and that's the exact amount, is uh, now costs 14 million six hundred thousand boulevards. And that's what 14 million six hundred thousand boulevards looks like. Two pounds of tomatoes sells for five million boulevards. A roll of toilet paper sells for two thousand two million six hundred thousand. I'm thinking, you know, just keep the keep the boulevard and use that. You'd be, you'd be down there, you'd be further ahead. <laughs> so, to understand socialism as it is in our culture, I think we have to first take a, at least a little bit of time to look at the originator of this philosophy. He was a man by the name of Karl Marx. And when you study the life of Karl Marx, uh, you learn that he wasn't just a hater of God. He was actually a cheerleader for the devil. His family thought him possessed by a demon. A biographer who, who studied his life said this, that he had the devil's view of the world and the devil's malignity. Sometimes he seemed to know that he was, that he was accomplishing the works of evil. On one occasion, Mark's own son sent him a letter and addressed it, my dear devil. Marx's partner, Frederick Ingalls, declared that 10,000 devils had Marx by the hair. That was his partner. (laughs) Marx was a tyrant. 
He was a racist, misogynist, radical who hated God and honestly, I think, just wanted to see the world burn. In a poem that he wrote in 1837 titled The Pale Maiden, he wrote this in one of his own poems. Thus heaven I forfeited, I know it full well. My soul, once true to God, has been chosen for hell. So this man, Karl Marx, he never had a job. He mooched off of everybody, his parents, his partner, Ingalls, anyone he could find. His wife, Jenny, was so miserable in their marriage, she wanted to die, a wish that she pondered daily. Never did it, but her daughters apparently fulfilled the wish, both daughters of Marx committing suicide. So Karl Marx died on March 14th, 1883, and just before his death, he wrote to his partner and friend Ingalls, how pointless and empty is life, he said, and yet how desirable. He was buried in the highway, Highgate Cemetery, considered to be the center of Satanism in London. And I think perhaps maybe the most surprising thing about Marxism to me as I've studied this is you know, how deadly it has been. Christianity leads to life, Marxism leads to death. In 1999, the Black Book of Communism endeavored to attempt the impossible task, really, of of tabulating the Marxist-Lenin death toll just for the 20th century. And it revealed the most colossal case of political carnage in history. In Latin America, chalked up to socialism, 150,000 deaths in the 20th century. Eastern Europe, one million deaths. Vietnam, one million deaths. Africa, 1.7 million deaths. Cambodia, two million deaths. North Korea, two million deaths. The USSR, 20 million deaths. China, 65 million deaths. I mean, even Adolf Hitler got nowhere close to this. In fact, Neither did the two deadliest wars in history. You would have to combine all the deaths, both civilian and soldiers, of World War I combined with World War II and then double that to even come close to communism's butcher bill. And so when I look at Proverbs 28, evil people do not know what justice is. Those who worship the Lord understand it well. When I look at that verse, I'm thinking evil people don't know what justice is. Honestly, for me, that would be reason enough for me to give pause to give uh, Karl Marx any validity or or, um, consideration. It really would. (sighs) Puzzling to me how a Christ follower could align themselves with a Marxist socialist agenda. Now, next week, I want to introduce to you why I, I, I think that you know, uh, a free market system is so far superior to a socialistic type of system. And I'll talk more about this next week. But what you will see next week is those pillars that I referred to at the beginning of any economic system, whether it's socialism, communism, fascism, or a free market and capitalism, These four components of who owns the property, what gets produced, how it is produced, and how the output is distributed. Those four components exist in any economic system. Those four components exist with socialism, with fascism, with free market. The only thing that's different is really who's in control of those four things. And I'll give you a little tip. You can see that in socialism, really the state, you know, the people who are really just a select few of the government, the state is actually in control of all of these things in a socialistic, and as we'll look at next week, the scripture really supports the idea that all of these things should be held by private individuals and not by government, which is why I support a free market approach because it is simply the most biblically true approach. So, we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about each of those four pillars. But to wrap up for today, Living Hope, I just want to speak to the big question and the debate between liberals and conservatives over this whole thing. And that is, you know, care and provision for the under-resourced, for the laborer, for the guy who has no, no power, for the, for the little guy, if you will, you know? Um, but by under-resourced, I just mean poor, workers, laborers, those who have no power, no authority, 
And indeed, this is a subject that is absolutely near and dear to the heart of God. It's one of the most often mentioned topics throughout all of Scripture about care for the under-resourced. Just to give you a few examples, uh, Deuteronomy, Moses writes, there will never cease to be poor in the land. We'll talk a little bit about that next week, about, you know, because Jesus said the same thing in the New Testament, and that has some implications, but that's for next week. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in the land. Another verse in Exodus says, sow and reap your crops for six years, but let the land rest and lie fallow during the seventh year. And you know why he said to do this? The seventh year, hey man, take a break, go on vacation, take a holiday. The reason why that seventh year you were just supposed to leave your your fields alone is for this reason. It says, uh, uh, let the poor among the people harvest any volunteer crop crop that may come up. Leave the rest for the animals to enjoy. The same rule applies to your vineyards and your olive groves. And then there's another statement about care and provision that is to be done Every year in ancient Israel, and this is found in Leviticus, it says, and when you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of the fields. Do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your grape crop. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines. Do not pick up the grapes that have fallen to the ground. And then he goes on to say, why? Because you want to leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. It's interesting to note that both Exodus and Leviticus, the care for the under-resourced in all these examples as you look in this in scripture, all of these do suggest that there is some effort that needs to be applied on the part of those who are actually being helped. In other words, those being helped, they still need to be the ones that expend the energy to, to go to the field and to go to the edges and gather what was left around the edges and to pick up what got dropped by the harvesters. They have to go to the field. They have to do the picking up. They have to carry it home. They have to prepare for consumption. You take a look at this in scripture, you'll find this to be a true statement that the Bible compassion leans more towards providing opportunity more so than handouts and entitlements. And again, next week, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what does that mean? Interesting how... We all understand this principle when it comes to family. All of us have either had a child or we have seen a child that, you know, really, they just would not be willing to exert any effort. They weren't willing to, uh, you know, get off the rear end and and do something with their day. And, uh, And then sadly, sometimes parents will enable that kind of behavior by letting them get away with it and just supply them. And we see what becomes of such a child who has no industriousness, who, who never takes initiative to go out and, and make a, an honest dollar. Uh, you know, they grow up and, and become generally a, a pretty unhealthy, bum-like individual, right? And we get that on a family level. But when it comes to national politics, we don't seem to get that as a nation. Psalm 41, King David itemizes the blessing of being kind to the poor. He says this, he says, God blesses those who are kind to the poor. And then he tells us what that blessing actually looks like. He says he helps them out of their troubles. That's one blessing. He protects them. These are the ones who help the poor. He helps, he protects them and keeps them alive. He publicly honors them and destroys the power of their enemies. Verse three, he nurses them when they are sick and soothes their pain and worries. You know, in other words, God will bless you for your kindness to the poor in pretty much the same way that you're being kind to the poor. You give this to the poor and God's blessing will be he'll, do, he'll be your father and do all of the above toward you. It's the principle of blessing throughout scripture that God comes to Abraham and says, listen, I'm gonna make you a great nation. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I'm gonna bless you, Abraham, so that you can be a blessing to the rest of the earth, which is really a truth extended throughout scripture, certainly to us as New Testament Christ followers, that God blesses us so that we can, in fact, be a blessing. And then, if we're not careful, Solomon gives us a, a, uh, a warning of what happens when we are not generous towards the 
under-resourced. Proverbs 21 says, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. In other words, what you do towards under-resourced people is sort of what happens to you. You reap what you sow. Good or bad, it's really up to you. And so the Bible is pretty clear. Be compassionate, be generous. God's blessing on your life is very much factored by how you care for the other. Now, a lot of socialists have come along and have cited Acts chapter 2 as a Bible evidence for support of their narrative. Shortly after Jesus was crucified and rose again from the dead, his followers waited for the promised Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. 120 of them are gathered together in that upper room, and there's an explosion of Holy Spirit presence and power that transforms people. It's the birth of the church. And after that, these people were persecuted. Those first century Christians were persecuted. Many of them fled with their, uh, you know, with uh, the, the clothes on their back. Uh, I mean, boy. Welcome to spirit-led Christianity. Now run for your life. And in that backdrop and in that context, we get this experience that these first century Christians had a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed miraculous signs, many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Quite a contrast to what we see today in response to the, to the uh, pandemic of people hoarding. Ay, ay, ay. What a contrast. But here's the critical issue as we examine Acts 2. Is that support for a socialistic narrative? It really raises this question, that is, should generosity be mandated, which it would be under socialistic policy? Well, listen, Acts 2 really doesn't say, but when we move over to Acts 5, we get some insight around this question. We're all familiar with the story of Ananias and Sapphira, a couple who, uh, like many people were doing, they owned property, they sold some property, they come to Peter, the leader of this, of this uh, radical band of, uh, of Christ followers, and tell him that this was the full price of the sale of their property, but in reality, it was only a partial price. They said it was so much, in reality, they kept some for themselves, in fact. And then the story picks up here. Peter said, Ananias, Satan has filled your heart. When you claimed this was the full price, you were lying to the Holy Spirit. The property, and this is what I want you to hear, Living Hope, the property was yours to sell or not. It was your call. There's no mandated generosity involved here. To sell or not, as you wished. And after selling it, it was yours to decide how much to give. You didn't have to give the whole thing. It would have been okay for you to say, hey, you know, it sold for 10 bucks. Here's five. I'm keeping five for myself. Had they been honest about that, that would have been just fine. How could you do such a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but you were lying to God. Now, you all know the story. It did not end well for Ananias and Sapphira. But that's not the point that I'm making this morning. The point is, is that they were under no requirement to give. In another setting, the Apostle Paul comes along and he writes a letter to the church at Corinth. In fact, it was the second letter that he wrote. And in the context of this verse, the Corinthian church had made a promise that they would take up an offering and they would give that money to the struggling church in Jerusalem, the mother church, if you will. Paul was setting up delegates to come to receive that financial gift and to collect it. And he's writing to them about, hey, and as you do this gift thing, please, I want you to do it with the right heart. And then he gives these details about what the right heart is. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Here it is. And each should give what he has decided in his heart. What he has decided, not what the state has decided. And he should give what... what, uh, What he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly, nor under compulsion. 
Pretty critical biblical idea there. For God loves a cheerful giver. And believe me, when it's not by free will, when it's not something that you decide to do, there's no chance that it will ever be done cheerfully. I mean, just think about your tax burden each year. Listen, the Bible is clear. One's giving and generosity. It should be viewed as an act of worship simply because that's pleasing to God when we are generous. It's an act of worship. It should be generous. We should be mindful that what comes in is connected to what goes out. In other words, this whole deal of give and receive is all connected. We sow, we reap what we sow. And it should never be under compulsion. And it's sad that in our culture, everyone thinks themselves an advocate for the under-resourced, but few are actually generous with their own resources. Culture, and socialists in particular, essentially practice a generosity that says, I'll be generous with your resources, uh, not with my own. You know, I have a unique position in my counseling to meet with people that are far from God every day, and I've had a handful of conversations around these type of uh, subjects. An argument that has oftentimes come up is that, well, listen, if, if giving and generosity and care for the under-resourced were on a voluntary basis, then no one would be generous and no needs would ever be met. And you know what? I concede in the debate that sadly, I think there is some truth to that. And then on the other hand, when I have debates with people about generosity and an advocate, I will usually try to get around asking the question, so what percentage do you actually give away to under-resourced people? Tell me about your personal generosity. I can't tell you how many times I've had this conversation. It hasn't been hundreds, but it's been more than a few conversations. And to date, I can tell you 100% of the people I've talked to do not give by a percentage. They drop a few coins in the pot at Christmas time when Santa's ringing a bell out in front of Costless. That's what their personal generosity looks like. And honestly, just straight up, I'll tell you, you know, uh, you do not have my attention about the whole subject of generosity if you are not a giver by percentage. Whatever that percentage is, that's between you and God. But I can tell you that if it's not even a 1%, if there is no percentage, if, it's, if I have some, if I feel like it, if I'm inclined, if the offering plate comes around, but there is no percentage giving, then from a Bible standpoint, you don't qualify as generous. And sorry, I'm not gonna give you a whole lot of credibility about your thoughts and views on generosity when you yourself don't practice it. It's a bit hypocritical. So, I don't think that there are any simple answers to the problem of what to do about the under-resourced. I, I think that there are ideas that help, ideas that are far superior to that of socialism that we'll get into next week. But in terms of talking points to our kids, and I guess I'm thinking more about kids who, you know, if they aren't already being indoctrinated, I promise you when they go off to college, they will be. You know, the odds are that by the time your kids finish college, if they're not armed with some truth, they will probably be left-leaning socialistic ideas, maybe not a card-carrying socialist, but left-leaning ideas regarding economy. They'll be all about those freebies, you know? So we have to give them some talking points. So idea number one is, let's communicate to our children that God is actually our provider and not government. That's a pretty good start, amen? (laughs) that God is our provider, not government. Talk to our kids that God gives us minds, he gives us hands, he gives us a heart to be industrious, to work, and to represent him on the job. And I think we can also talk to our kids that work and provision go hand in hand, that the cost of free is simply too high. The cost of free means losing our freedom, losing our dignity, losing our purpose, losing our contribution in the world. And then talking point number two, I think we should tell our kids that generosity is good and works best when it's a choice. (laughs) Works best when it's a choice. 
I mean, I think the good part of this statement is self-explanatory, but choice being good, I mean, it's not only because it's critical to enjoying God's blessing because he wants us to be cheerful givers. I mean, it's important on a whole lot of levels. In my personal opinion, why I think giving that's choice and not mandatory is so important, it's because of the impact that it has on relationships. Especially our, just like in any personal relationship, we all understand this, that if you can't say no to a spouse or a friend, then your yes means nothing. It's why good friends don't manipulate each other, why spouses don't manipulate each other. You know the definition of manipulation. It's posing a request in a way that makes it difficult for the other person to say no. That's what manipulation is. You know, when I have favors to ask of friends, I usually swing the door of no wide open. I mean, I'll lie to you and say, hey, you know, I need a hand, but listen, if you've got stuff going on, I totally understand. I've got a bunch of other people I could ask. Even if I don't, I'll tell you that. Because I don't want to manipulate you into anything. Because, well, you all have been on the receiving ends of manipulative people. I guarantee you, when the manipulative people, once they're identified as such, when their name comes up on your phone, you don't pick up, right? <laughs> <laughs> love simply cannot exist in a relationship or a society without the choice to do either good or bad. It's exactly why God himself does not make people and make it mandatory that people surrender to him. He gives us a choice about that. He doesn't make us be born again. He gives us a choice about that. Yes means nothing if you can't say no. Now listen, this is a big subject, Living Hope. I mean, there's so much more that we could have addressed about this. I mean, for example, you know, what, what do we do with the socialism light factors that are already in our governmental and economic system? What do we do about that? And there are some that are already present that really fit the bill of socialism that we are living with currently, although we may not think of it along those lines. Minimum wage, 40-hour work weeks, paid sick, vacation leave, unemployment insurance, pensions, social security disability insurance, Medicaid, food stamps, medical benefits, Medicare. Under a technical definition, those would all be socialistic ideas. You know, they're rooted in socialism. All exist to protect those who have no power, the laborer, if you will. Are all those things bad? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm sure... Uh, <laughs> What I am most confident about is that a lot of the confusion will be lessened when we get back to those four pillars that exist within any economic system and we examine what the scripture has to say about who should control personal property, what gets produced, how it gets produced, and how salary and wages are determined. The scripture does speak very clearly to those four things. And I think moving forward, if we educate our children about those four things, if we vote uh, legislature, legislators in who are good with uh, the right view on those four things, we'll lessen the problem. As I said in the beginning, I don't think that there is such a thing as a perfect economic system. I don't think there is such a thing as truly fair for all. We just do wise decision making, doing the best we can with hopefully an eye for doing right by all people. I for one look at this kind of stuff and it's one reason, one of the many, many reasons why I just look forward to Jesus coming back. <laughs> <laughs> these kind of things no longer having to be addressed. Don't you look forward to that? Amen. Well, Father, we want to be people who steward well the blessings that we have in this land. And Lord, I do see an erosion of values and integrity that have upheld this nation 
to make it more of a blessing than any nation that's ever been on this earth. And I see the foundations of these blessings being undermined, not the least of which by socialistic thinking. Lord, you know all of our hearts. You know all of our capacity for being uh, given to power, being given to greed, even corruption. You know our capacity for all of that, Lord. And I pray, first of all, for us, that our hearts would be pure in your sight, that you would expose any such ugliness within our heart and give us grace and power to repent. And Lord, we would live simple lives quietly in your presence and power, representing you being salt and light, moving in the might and strength of your spirit. And Lord, what influence we have with our kids, with our neighbor, with any and all, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to the heart of each one here and you would equip them to speak intelligently to these issues. And Lord, I know that nobody's mind's gonna be changed on these kind of things unless your spirit moves on such hearts. And so I pray that we would all have that Holy Spirit anointing to speak your word, to speak gospel truth, and in doing so, Lord, I know you'll take care of the rest of impact on this broken world that we live in. Now, let me know if I just feel like the Lord wants to say that to you, that if you'd be willing to understand, you'd be willing to do your homework on this thing, that the Lord will equip you. He will strengthen you. He will commission you to bring truth into the darkness. And how many of you know that when light comes into darkness, the darkness is dispelled? <laughs> Amen. Stand with me. I'm going to dismiss you at this time.